All right, hi everybody. So today we're doing another Q&A and the, the three topics I have in front of me are cheat meals. People love cheat meals. Building bigger arms. Hitting your goals. So those I thought were three good questions. All right, so um, the first question comes from Chris and he says, uh, I'm not sure if I should take a cheat meal or not. Uh, I have a problem mentally with taking cheat meals. So let's talk about cheat meals. So what is a cheat meal exactly? And there are many different ways to look at it. Some people call it a refeed meal. Some people just call it a psychological break. Just eat whatever you want. And I want to approach this from a couple different angles. So. If you are dieting and you've been dieting a long time, eating what we're gonna call clean meals, then I use a rule, I use a rule called 90-10. So if 90% of my meals are good and clean, I'm gonna call it for lack of a better term, then the other 10%, I've got some wiggle room in there to have some fun. So let's say you eat five times a day. So that's uh, in two days, that's 10 meals. So nine of your meals are going to be these so-called clean meals, and one of them is going to be a kind of a fun meal to enjoy yourself. Now, many times you see me on my Instagram posting pictures of pancakes and French toast, and guess what that is? That's the 10%. You don't always see the 90% I'm eating. You don't see the chicken salads, and you don't see the egg white omelets or the whole eggs and avocado and all those healthy foods. But I think in general, if you adopt a rule of 90-10, that you're gonna you're gonna do really well okay so you you got to live life a little bit and there's something else to be said about that 10 percent you can use that 10 percent uh, as a like a family meal too like you can eat with your family you can go out and eat with your friends so you can continue to cultivate social connections you can continue to build your relationship with your family there's nothing that drives me more crazy than when people say food is nothing more than fuel that is a very sad statement, and it speaks to the quality of someone's life when they say that. Food is an opportunity for you to bond socially, culturally. It's been done um, in all other cultures. You sit down and eat with your family. I think one of the, just a side note here, I think one of the biggest problems we have in our culture today is people don't sit down to eat together. They're so busy, oh, I'll just eat whenever. I'll just throw something in the microwave and eat it, or I'll just go through fast food and eat it. So, there's an opportunity there for you to eat with your family, to eat, you know, something. Maybe you go out and you have go to Five Guys hamburgers and fries. Maybe you go out to go to an Italian place and get some pasta. Whatever it is that you guys like to do. But I like to always encourage people to keep that in there so that they're still spending time with their loved ones or friends or families. Because as you get older, you're going to realize those social connections and your family connections are way important than subbing out. Um, you know, your tuna for the day with a hamburger if you want to do that. So that's my philosophy on that. Now, now when you're going into a contest, I tighten it up a little bit, but I still use, I still let people have one meal a week in general. Now, I don't know where you're at, Chris, in your diet. It's hard for me to say. I don't know if you're shredded or if you're completely behind. I don't know. But generally speaking, let's say you eat six meals a day if you're dieting for a contest. So that gives you 42 meals a week. If you eat 41 of those meals, um, you know, that are pretty standard basic meals, and then the, the 42nd meal, you have some fun, I don't see a problem with that. I don't see a problem with that. And there's even beyond physiological benefit, there's psychological benefit. You can relax. Again, you can have some fun with your family and go to the movies. You know, that's what we used to do a lot of times when I'm dieting on Friday night go out and have five guys and then go to the movies and watch a movie, maybe have an icy or something like that. But um, so you should still allow a little bit of that wiggle room in there. I mean, one, again, it's one meal a week. And all those people that are around you, supporting you when you're dieting or whatever, it's a way for you to have fun with them so that they're not alienated, you know? There's nothing worse than seeing people lose friendships and so forth because someone is so tunnel visioned on bodybuilding or whatever it is they just forget they even have a life you know those people as they get older they look back and they regret that 
you know, and, and I've been there. I've been there. I know what it's like to go to the buffet with uh, people and take cans of tuna, and, you know, um, and rather than having a little bit of fun or just not even going with them all. Tell them I'm actually that's worse. Tell them I'm just not going to go with you. I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit in my house for, for, for four months. And then you get people to compete year round, so they're always sitting in their house. So, Chris, just um, don't be afraid to have a meal that you enjoy once a week if you're deep into your diet. And when you're not in your heavy diet phase, man, have a meal every, every other day. Have something you enjoy. As long as your calories are roughly where they need to be, it's not going to make or break you. But it could make you in terms of your happiness, your family, and so forth. Now, the second question I had was building bigger arms. Okay, so this came from uh, Josh. So, Josh, building bigger arms. I'm going to give you some of the some tips, some things that I've learned along the way. For many of your body parts, you know, your chest, your legs, your back, progressive overload seems to be a fantastic tool, one of the big tools. Getting stronger as you go, getting stronger and stronger as you go, a little bit at a time. It's a, it's very proven scientifically that that can help muscle fiber size. Muscles get the muscle fiber actually gets bigger, and you'll grow. You can't always get stronger and stronger. Eventually that levels out, but you can try. Now with arms, arms are a little different story. What I found myself and with many, many people is when, you, when you're trying to go heavier and heavier and heavier on arms, you end up with tendonitis. You can get you know, lateral epicondylitis or medial epicondylitis, you know, tennis elbow or golfer's elbow. People get tendonitis in their elbows really easy. And when you're going heavy all the time on curls, skull crushers, it's just a matter of time until your elbows are injured. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you to do something different. Lighten up the weight a little bit on your arms. And I know people like to make fun of, of flexing and squeezing and all that, but I want you to focus on flexing really hard, a good mind-to-muscle connection. Now, since you're not using progressive overload as much on your arms, there still has to be a stimulus created Okay, so now what you're going to do is you're going to use lighter weights, but you're going to go to failure. If you get this is called, uh, what do they call it now? You guys are called a metabolic training or something like that. Um, but if you go to failure, so normally if you're not using heavy weights, you're not going to activate all your muscle fibers. Now if you're using lighter weight, as you get closer to fatigue, uh, fibers actually will not produce much force, so more fibers are called into action to keep the set going. So if you take these lighter sets to failure, and by lighter I mean I'm going to say 45 to 65 percent of your one rep max, but if you take them to failure, there's still a good chance you can nail all your muscle fibers and you can still grow. Um, and then you know you have all these uh, all these other benefits with um, blood flow and pressure on the cell membrane, all this, all this sciencey stuff that's um, also show, shows that you can grow muscle that way too. So, so for building your arms, I want you to lighten up your weight to 45 to 65 percent of your one rep max. I know that's a pretty big discrepancy there, but if you find that your elbows are getting beat up, go more toward that 45 percent. If you're feeling pretty strong, you can state that 65 percent. But don't get up into 90, 85, 90 percent of your one rep max uh, frequently on arm work because you will pay for it. So a little bit lighter. The advantage of that too is you can do them a little bit more often. And then the other thing is just remember, don't be in a panic because your triceps and biceps are still getting loaded pretty heavy when you do your chest and your back. I actually built a training program, program number 18 on my website. I built it because I built it with very little arm work, direct arm work, because I had really, really bad tendonitis to the point where I didn't think it was going to go away. Okay, and so I built this program. And since I didn't have an arm day, I had extra time to do my torso work. So I did more chest work and more back work, and at the end, it turned out to be my favorite program. And at the end of the at the end of the 12 weeks, my arms looked the same. They didn't look any better, but they didn't look any worse. And I didn't train them very, very little at all directly. I just relied on the torso work to keep them. And guess what else happened? My tendonitis went completely away. And really, it's never come back fully. I've had it come back a little tiny bit here and there. And then I just back off. I quit doing direct arm work again. It goes away. So just something to think about. The third one uh, was goal setting. Uh, Walter just asked me, 
what, uh, what, what's your thoughts around uh, goal setting and achieving your goals? And, you know, I like to talk about mindset. I think nowadays people just want something to happen so fast. They're not willing to suffer and really work hard for, uh, to achieve their goals. And, you know, you've got to set realistic goals. People are like, I have people come to me all the time. I've never competed, but I want to be a pro in two years. Maybe it's realistic if you're in the genetic elite, but 99% of us aren't genetic elite, so it's probably not realistic. So, you know, set realistic goals. How about this? I'm going to gain two pounds of muscle this month, all right? Now, if you do that every month, that is 24 pounds of muscle in a year. That's actually, for many of you, probably not even realistic. That's probably even too crazy. You might want to say one pound a month. But when you tell somebody that, well, I need you to gain one pound a month of muscle, they're like, oh, that's not much. But pure skeletal muscle tissue, one pound a month, is actually a very fair amount. So I need you to set realistic goals. And here's the other thing. Inevitably, you're going to have times where it just feels like you're spinning your wheels. Think about all the second place finishes I had, year after year, second place, or even second call out show after show, pro qualifier to pro qualifier, it's going to be, you're going to have these thoughts creep into your mind and say, you know what, maybe you need to quit. Maybe you need to do something else. But until you have fully exhausted your potential, you've got to kick those thoughts out of your mind. You've got to say, no, nope, I'm going to get better. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to get more creative with my training or I'm going to, I'm going to do something to get better with my eating but I'm not going to just cash out until I know I've done it. I've given it my all. And here's the key. You want to be able to look back. You want to say, I did everything I could. You know, it would have been nice if I could have been Mr. Olympia. It didn't happen, but you know what? I know I did everything I could do to make it happen. It just wasn't in the cards for me, and that's okay. But if I would have quit in, say, 2015 after I got my pro card, you know, I wouldn't have placed in five pro shows. Be, you know, I, I would have quit if I would have said I'm just not good enough to place. But I felt like if I made improvements, I could place in pro shows, and I did. So, you know, it's okay to be realistic, but don't, but don't throw in the towel, man. I mean, you just got to grind day in and day out. It's not the sexy answer that people want to hear, but it's the truth. So I got it. my obligation is to be honest with you and share the truth. So that's what it is. So set goals that are realistic that you can attain. And when times are tough, you just got to keep plugging, man. You just got to keep plugging. So, Walter, I appreciate that question. I actually get asked that a lot. I was on a podcast today, and they asked me, did you ever think about quitting? Of course I did. And then I kicked that thought right out of my mind, and I kept going. So those are the three questions. If you guys have any thoughts on those, or if you want to submit more questions down below, feel free to submit more questions. I'm going to do these three question Q&As much more often. The first one we did was, a, was very successful. We we're super happy with it. So we're going to continue to do these. But uh, if you like this, please subscribe and share it. Thanks, everyone, for, for supporting my YouTube channel. I appreciate it. It's growing, and I, it wouldn't be growing without you. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.